This is the second video, but the third story of The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. This is the third story. The flower garden of the woman skilled in magic. How did little Gerda get along when Kay did not come back? Where could he be? Nobody knew. Nobody could give them any news of him. All that the boys could say was that they had seen him hitch his little sled to a fine big sleigh, which had driven down the street and out through the town gate. Nobody knew what had become of Kay. Many tears were shed, and little Gerda sobbed hardest of all. People said that he was dead, that he must have been drowned in the river not far from town. Ah, how gloomy those long winter days were. But spring and its warm sunshine came at last. Kay is dead and gone, little Gerda said. I don't believe it, said the sunshine. He's dead and gone, she said to the swallows. We don't believe it, they sang. Finally, little Gerda began to disbelieve it too. One morning, she said to herself, I'll put on my new red shoes, the ones Kay has never seen, and I'll go down by the river to ask about him. It was very early in the morning. She kissed her old grandmother, who was still asleep, put on her red shoes, and all by herself, she hurried out through the town gate and down to the river. Is it true that you have taken my own little playmate? I'll give you my red shoes if you will bring him back to me. It seemed to her that the waves nodded very strangely, so she took off her red shoes, which were her dearest possession, and threw them into the river. But they fell near the shore, and the little waves washed them right back to her. It seemed that the river could not take her dearest possession, because it did not have little Kay. However, she was afraid that she'd not thrown them far enough, so she clambered into a boat that lay among the reeds, walked to the end of it, and threw her shoes out into the water again. But the boat was not tied, and her movements made it drift away from the bank. She realised this, and tried to get ashore, but by the time she reached the other end of the boat, it was already more than a yard from the bank, and was fast gaining speed. Little Gerda was so frightened that she began to cry, and no one was there to hear her, except the sparrows. They could not carry her to land, but they flew along the shore, twittering, Here we are, here we are, as if to comfort her. The boat drifted swiftly down the stream, and Gerda sat there, quite still, in her stocking feet. Her little red shoes floated along behind, but they could not catch up with her, because the boat was gathering headway. It was very pretty on both sides of the river, where the flowers were lovely, the trees were old, and the hillsides afforded pasture for cattle and sheep. But not one single person did Gerda see. Perhaps the river shall take me to little Kay, she thought, and that made her feel more cheerful. She stood up and watched the lovely green banks for hour after hour. Then she came to a large cherry orchard, in which there was a little house with strange red and blue windows. It had a thatched roof, and outside it stood two wooden soldiers, who presented arms to everyone who sailed past. Gerda thought they were alive, and called out to them, but of course they did not answer her. She drifted quite close to them as the current drove the boat toward the bank. Gerda called even louder, and an old, old woman came out of the house. She leaned on a crooked stick. She had on a big sun hat, and on it were painted the most glorious flowers. "'Oh, you poor little child!' the woman exclaimed. However did you get lost on this big, swift river, and however did you drift so far into the great wide world? The old woman waded right into the water, caught hold of the boat with her crooked stick, and pulled it in to shore, and lifted Gerda out of it. Gerda was very glad to be on dry land again, but she felt a little afraid of this strange old woman, who said to her, Come and tell me who you are, and how you got here. Gerda told her all about it. The woman shook her head and said, Hmm, hmm. And when Gerda had told her everything, and asked if she hadn't seen little Kay, the woman said he had not yet come by, but that he might be along any day now. And she told Gerda not to take it so to heart, but to taste her cherries and to look at her flowers. These were more beautiful than any picture book, and each one had a story to tell. Then she led Gerda by the hand into her little house, and the old woman locked the door. The windows were placed high up on the walls, and through their red, blue and yellow panes, the sunlight streamed in a strange mixture of all the colours there are. But on the table were the most delicious cherries, 
and Gerda, who was no longer afraid, ate as many as she liked. While she was eating them, the old woman combed her hair with a golden comb. Gerda's pretty hair fell in shining yellow ringlets on either side of a friendly little face that was as round and blooming as a rose. I so often wished for a dear little girl like you, the old woman told her. Now you'll see how well the two of us will get along. While her hair was being combed, Gerda gradually forgot all about Kay, for the woman was skilled in magic. But she was not a wicked witch. She only dabbled in magic to amuse herself, but she wanted very much to keep little Gerda. So she went out into her garden and pointed her crooked stick at all the rose bushes. In the full bloom of their beauty, all of them sank down into the black earth without leaving a single trace behind. The old woman was afraid that if Gerda saw them, they would remind her so strongly of her own roses and of little Kay that she would run away again. Then Gerda was led into the flower garden. How fragrant and lovely it was! Every known flower of every season was there in full bloom. No picture book was ever so pretty and gay. Gerda jumped for joy and played in the garden until the sun went down behind the tall cherry trees. Then she was tucked into a beautiful bed under a red silk coverlet quilted with blue violets. There she slept, and there she dreamed as gloriously as any queen on her wedding day. The next morning she again went out into the warm sunshine to play with the flowers, and this she did for many a day. Gerda knew every flower by heart, and, plentiful though they were, she always felt that there was one missing, but which one she didn't quite know. One day she sat looking at the old woman's hat, and the prettiest of all the flowers painted on it was a rose. The old woman had forgotten this rose on her hat when she made the real roses disappear in the earth. But that's just the sort of thing that happens when one doesn't stop to think. Why aren't there any roses here? Gerda asked. She rushed out among the flower beds, and she looked and she looked, but there wasn't a rose to be seen. Then she sat down and cried. But her hot tears fell on the very spot where a rose bush had sunk into the ground. And when her warm tears moistened the earth, the bush sprang up again, as full of blossoms as when it disappeared. Gerda hugged it and kissed the roses. She remembered all her own pretty roses and thought of little Kay. Oh, how long I've been delayed, the little girl said. I should have been looking for Kay. Do you know where he is? She asked the roses. Do you think that he is dead and gone? Well, he isn't dead, the roses told her. We've been down in the earth where the dead people are, but Kay is not there. Thank you, said little Gerda, who went to all the other flowers, put her lips near them and asked, Do you know where little Kay is? But every flower stood in the sun and dreamed its own fairy tale or its story. Though Gerda listened to many, many of them, not one of the flowers knew anything about Kay. What did the tiger lily say? Do you hear the drum? Boom, boom. It was only two notes, always boom, boom. Hear the woman wail, hear the priests chant. The Hindu woman in her long red robe stands on the funeral pyre. The flames rise around her and her dead husband. But the Hindu woman is thinking of that living man in the crowd around them. She is thinking of him, whose eyes are burning hotter than the flames. Of him, whose fiery glances have pierced her heart more deeply than these flames that soon will burn her body to ashes. Can the flame of the heart die in the flame of the funeral pyre? I don't understand that at all, little Gerda said. That's my fairy tale, said the lily. What did the trumpet flower say? An ancient castle rises high from a narrow path in the mountains. The thick ivy grows leaf upon leaf, where it climbs to the balcony. There stands a beautiful maiden. She leans out over the balustrade to look down the path. No rose on its stem is as graceful as she, nor is any apple blossom in the breeze so light. Hear the rustle of her silk gown, sighing, will he never come? Do you mean Kay? little Gerda asked. I am talking about my own story, my own dream, the trumpet flower replied. What did the snowdrop say? Between the trees a board hangs by two ropes. It is a swing. Two pretty little girls, with frocks as white as snow, and long green ribbons fluttering from their hats are swinging. Their brother, who is bigger than they are, stands behind them on the swing, with his arms around the ropes to hold himself. In one hand he has a little cup, and in the other a clay pipe. 
He's blowing soap bubbles, and as the swing flies, the bubbles float off in all their changing colours. The last bubble is still clinging to the bowl of his pipe, and fluttering in the air as the swing sweeps to and fro. A little black dog, light as a bubble, is standing on his hind legs and trying to get up in the swing, but it does not stop. High and low the swing flies, until the dog loses his balance, barks, and loses his temper. They tease him, and the bubble bursts. A swinging board, pictured in a bubble before it broke. That's my story. It may be a very pretty story, but you told it very sadly, and you didn't mention Kay at all. What did the hyacinths say? There were three sisters, quite transparent and very fair. One wore a red dress, the second wore a blue one, and the third went all in white. Hand in hand they danced in the clear moonlight, beside a calm lake. They were not elven folk. They were human beings. The air was sweet, and the sisters disappeared into the forest. The fragrance of the air grew sweeter. Three coffins, in which lie the three sisters, glide out of the forest and across the lake. The fireflies hover about them, like little flickering lights. Are they dancing sisters sleeping, or are they dead? The fragrance of the flowers says that they are dead, but the evening bell tolls for their funeral. You're making me very unhappy, little Gerda said. Your fragrance is so strong that I cannot help thinking of those dead sisters. Oh, could little Kay really be dead? The roses have been down under the ground, and they say no. Ding dong, told the hyacinth bells. We do not toll for little Kay. We do not know him. We're simply singing our song. The only song we know. And Gerda went on to the buttercup that shone among its glossy green leaves. You are like a bright little sun, said Gerda. Tell me, do you know where I can find my playmate? And the buttercup shone brightly as it looked up at Gerda. But what sort of song would a buttercup sing? It certainly wouldn't be about Kay. In a small courtyard, God's sun was shining brightly on the very first day of spring. Its beams glanced along the white wall of the house next door. And close by grew the first yellow flowers of spring, shining like gold in the warm sunlight. An old grandmother was sitting outside in her chair. Her granddaughter, a poor but very pretty maidservant, had just come home for a little visit. She kissed her grandmother, and there was gold, a heart full of gold in that kiss. Gold on her lips, gold in her dreams, and gold above in the morning beams. There, I've told you my little story, said the buttercup. Oh, my poor old grandmother, said Gerda. She will miss me so. She must be grieving for me as much as she did for little Kay. But I'll soon go home again, and I'll bring Kay with me. There's no use asking the flowers about him. They don't know anything except their own songs, and they haven't any news for me. Then she tucked up her little skirts so that she could run away faster. But the narcissus tapped against her leg as she was jumping over it. So she stopped and leaned over the tall flower. Perhaps you have something to tell me, she said. What did the Narcissus say? I can see myself. I can see myself. Oh, how sweet is my own fragrance. Up in the narrow garret, there is a little dancer, half-dressed. First she stands on one leg, then she stands on both, and kicks her heels at the whole world. She's an illusion of the stage. She pours water from the teapot over a piece of cloth she is holding. It is her bodice. Cleanliness is such a virtue. Her white dress hangs from a hook. It too has been washed in the teapot and dried on the roof. She puts it on and ties a saffron scarf around her neck to make the dress seem whiter. Point your toes. See how straight she balances on that single stem. I can see myself. I can see myself. I'm not interested, said Gerda. What a thing to tell me about. She ran to the end of the garden, and though the gate was fastened, she worked the rusty latch until it gave way and the gate flew open. Little Gerda scampered out into the wide world in her bare feet. She looked back three times, but nobody came after her. At last, she could run no farther, and she sat down to rest on a big stone. When she looked up, she saw that summer had gone by and it was late in the fall. She could never have guessed it inside the beautiful garden, where the sun was always shining, and the flowers of every season were always in full bloom. Gracious, how long I've dallied, Gerda said. Fall is already here. I can't rest any longer. She got up to run on, but how footsore and tired she was, and how cold and bleak everything around her. 
The long leaves of the willow tree had turned quite yellow, and damp puffs of mist dropped from them like drops of water. One leaf after another fell to the ground. Only the blackthorn still bore fruit, and its fruit was so sour that it set your teeth on edge. Oh, how dreary and grey the wide world looked. That brings us to a close on part three, or the third story. I hope you're enjoying listening to this. Next week, I will have part four. And in the meantime, if you have enjoyed listening to this, then, you know, you can do all of the things that people normally ask you to do on the YouTube thing. The liking, the commenting, subscribing. If you would like to follow me around the internet, I've got a link to my Goodreads profile uh, and my Patreon page in the description. Um, so you can follow me there if you like. Also, thanks for the comments recently. Eric Kennedy, I think, has requested a story. And, oh dear, someone else, I've forgotten your name, recommended a fairy tale to me, which I have read and loved. So I will read that at some point. It's a, a nice Norwegian fairy tale. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that at some point in the future. Thanks for watching. See you next week for part four.